Good evening. Bell ringing, at, bell ringing at its best, a very English art. And for generations, the centre of the bell founding trade was in Leicestershire, the heart of England. And so tonight, we've brought the television cameras to Loughborough, to one of the very, very few foundries in the country that still make nothing else but bells. That bell that you can see uh, chiming there it weighs two and a half tons and it's quite a small bell in comparison with the loft that are made in the foundry here. But watch the rhythm of that mighty clapper. It's never in any hurry, and yet the note's always absolutely perfect. The thing sets the whole pace, really, the whole tempo for the foundry here. Nothing matters but craftsmanship and quality. Time doesn't matter at all. That chap there, that's horse muck and sand that he's putting on. Primitive ingredients as old as time itself. And with them, he's making part of a mould, he's making a core. But before we get down to the details of making bells, let me introduce you to Mr. Paul Taylor, the bell founder oh, himself. <coughs> Hello, well, Paul. Well, yeah. now, we've got a lot in common, I think, because we both work yeah. in the engineering industry, although that's my right, branch yeah. is a lot younger yeah. than yours. And we've both got an overwhelming love of, of craftsmanship. But I think that your roots must go a lot deeper than ours, don't they? Well, I think they do. My family has been bell founding for nearly 200 years. And uh, we like to think that this bell foundry traces its history back to the 14th century in Leicester. Well, that's a wonderful tradition, and you must be very proud of that. So and, uh, let's have a look at some of the things you do. Now, in order to make a bell, you have to have a, a mould which consists of a core for the inside of the bell and a cope for the outside. Now, this is the foundation of a core. It's built up solid, as you can see, of bricks. And this thing here, which is called a strickle in the ordinary foundry trade, that makes the shape, the exact shape of the bell. And this man builds up the foundation in bricks. And then, when, when the foundation is complete, we come back to the chap we saw a few moments ago, the chap who was putting on the horse muck and sand. Here he is, he's still working, he's working with the most primitive tool that you can have, he's working with his own hands as a potter would, and he's shaping and forming this bell with this strickle. And the point of the horse muck and sand is this, it is in fact loam, and uh, what's the particular mixture of loam we you're using? We call it loam, but it's a mix of sand and clay, chopped straw and horse manure. Right, well the, the, the point of the chopped straw and the horse manure is this, that this when it is finished, it has to be hardened off, so it's put in an oven, and the, the straw and the, and the straw in the horse manure burns away and leaves the whole of this frame permeable so that the gases can be forced through it. As the metal comes in, the gases can be forced through it. And, of course, a horse can chop up his straw a lot f finer than we can, so the holes are smaller and the finish is better and the bell itself will be smoother. Now, this is going to be the inside of the bell. This is the core and this strickle is shaping it, and we, 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 we would call it a strickle, but I don't think you do, do you, no, Paul? we call it a crook, after the shepherd's crook. Hundreds of years ago, it would look like a shepherd's crook, and bell founders call it a crook. Right, well, when this is complete, it has over it a cope, a cover over it, which leaves a space, the exact thickness of the bell, so that when the metal is poured in, it forms the bell itself between this and the cope. And we've got a cope here, uh, a finished cope, and I noticed, Paul, that it's a lovely satiny finish. It's much smoother than that. Well, we've polished this, as it were, with graphite and a few other things, just as your wife would polish her pans when she's cooking a cake, mm -hmm. she'd grease it all over so the cake wouldn't stick. Well, we polish this with graphite so that the metal won't stick. Mm -hmm. Now, we make it nice and smooth so that any mark that shouldn't be there, won't be there, but any mark that is there will show on the bell. Yes, I can, I can see some lettering here. It looks rather funny lettering. Now, this is it? the lettering. Now, you can see the date, 1956. Yes, but it's mirror fashion. It's ah, backwards. That's it. Because here, it's backwards way on, and it sticks out in relief on the bell, so it'll read 1956. So when the metal pours in, yes, I can see that. Well, let's have a look at the, at the furnace that you've cast them in, shall we? 
Well, now, they're just raking this furnace out now because a few moments ago, we took out a charge of metal and we, are, we will show you pouring some bells. But you can see just inside it, and it is a very primitive sort of furnace. It's, it's about the most primitive that you can have. I think it's coal-fired, isn't it? Coal-fired with really good coal, and the flames you can see sweeping over where the metal was. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things to me that I didn't know about this furnace is this, that in almost every village in England, in every town, you find somewhere near the church a, a bell lane or a bell field or a bell meadow. And the reason for that is that in the olden days when they made bells that were as heavy as they do today, the roads were so bad that they couldn't transport them until they got hard roads. And it was easier to build a furnace like this close to the church and cast the bells close to the church than it was to transport the bells uh, perhaps a hundred miles across country. And so they commemorated those spots by calling them Bell Lane and Bell Field. And here we've got a picture of a very old bell, which I think may, may be of some interest to you. Now, oh, can yes, you... I know that. Mm -hmm. This is what we call Great Paul of St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, it's a 17-tonner. 17-tonner? Ah, and yeah? it was cast in this very place where we are now, just over there, yes. in 1881. And this furnace we've just looked at... It uh, was one of the furnaces we used to get all the metal we wanted. Now, as far as I remember, I've heard of Great Paul because that's a very famous bell indeed, and it's the heaviest bell, isn't it, in the British Empire? That's is that it, right? Yes, that's right. Well, that's wonderful. Let's go and have a look at what they're doing the now Empire here. Was very proud of it. And well, that's why he called me Paul. <laughs> he called you Paul after that's that, right, did he? Yes. They'd run after names of boys. So when I when I arrived, I was one of the large family, so he called me Paul as a result. Well, uh, yeah. it's a great honour, I think, Paul too. Well, they've just been pouring bells here. Uh, they poured two, and they're just doing the third. And these two chaps that you can see here waggling these sticks up and down are what's known as feeding because sticking up out of the ground here is the cope that you saw, the outside case. Inside that is the core. And this is a reservoir. They've been pouring metal into it, but it's got a very narrow neck down into the bell itself. And in order to make certain that the metal runs right down and fills all the crevices, they keep doing this to keep that neck quite clear. Another rather intriguing thing to me that uh, never occurred to me was this, that in the days I've just told you about, when they used to take the uh, furnace to the church and cast the bells, they hadn't got a, a crane to lift a ladle like this. This is a, a, about the only concession to modernity I've seen here, I think. And so what they used to do, they used to bury these cores right in the ground and then run a channel, a trough, from the furnace right across the floor and into these so that they didn't need to lift the metal at all. They used to pour it in. And then they eventually, uh, when the metal cools, they lift that off, they break, they dig the core and the cope out, they break them apart, and beneath they find the bells. And I don't know whether you can see, but on each of these is chalked the destination where the bells are going to. This one here is going to the Persian Gulf, and the next one's going to India, and the next one's going to Calgary in Canada, so that you can see that this foundry here does make bells that go all over the world, and I think that it's something that to be very, very proud of. But when they're finished, when they've taken these out of here, they've still got a bit tuned. They're not in exact tune. And a moment ago, Paul Taylor went over, the, over to the other side of the works, to the tuning shop, and I'm going to join him there in a moment, and he's going to show us just how he tunes these bells after they've been cast. Bye, Alan. Stop it. Now this bell here was cast a day or two ago. Naturally, it wasn't one of those you've just seen cast. Going to Australia, and for that reason, I've got to make a very good do of it. And as I came in, you saw the bell turning round, and what was happening, this machine tool here was cutting metal off. Here, over in the foundry, we make sure that there's too much metal on the bell. Obviously, you can take metal off, but you can't put it on. And it just cut 
but we've done now is the finishing cut pretty well of the bell. It's got to be sounding very nice, ready for the folk over in Australia to hear it. And I'm now going to sound it so you'll hear it. And here it is. Now to me that sounds all right, but I'm going to show here some tuning forks. When you sound the bell, it gives a note. It also gives lots of harmonics as well. And the first half dozen of these harmonics, as near as I can get, I've got on these tuning forks over here. Now, I'll sound them to you, and you can perhaps pick them out. I'll do it again for those who think they know all about it. Here we are. Ah, you've got to overcome cool. it. Very well. Uh, very well, I've got a far sounding the notes. Good. Now, you're a musical chap. <laughs> oh, and, uh, uh, I'm not uh, I've that. just done, you heard these forks going, didn't mm -hmm. you? So I'm going to give the bell a blow, and you ought to be able to pick out these forks on this bell. Here we are. Now, I'm sure you can pick them out. Well, that sounds very nice, but I, I can't tell quite which. Well, do it true. again, then. No, there I are. still can't. It sounds right, they look rather interesting, these four. Can we have a look at them? Ah, oh, yes, but don't look at these too much, because those are ordinary. These are the ones I'm very proud of, round here. I'll draw out these little trays here, mm -hmm. and you'll see dozens of forks all laid out like this, with the marks on them, figures on them, showing the frequencies of the tuning forks. That's very interesting. I yeah. take this out to the churches, just like a commercial traveller would, take it at the top of the church, sound the bell, measure them with here, and there we are. Well, what do these old bells in these old churches sound like, Paul? Well, they're rather like beer. Some are good and some are not so good. Well, none not so good, I don't think. Uh, well, here's a peal of six bells, come from a little village, just as they were. And I'm going to sound them. Now, you being a clever chap will hear what it sounds like. And here we are. <laughs> You can tell that not quite what they should be. Not too good at all. No. That's right, no. <laughs> but uh, here, I can got a new peel of bells, and the old ones, I can't equal these, but I can improve them, so mm -hmm. that the villagers will think that they're very good, but not nearly so good as this new peel of bells going to a church in Yorkshire. You see uh, those, then? Here are these. Aren't they? Those are all together better than That's it, yes. Now, we, we, we've seen how they're tuned and how they're made. Can we see how they're Yes, hung? you'll come along here, then. What's this, uh, this old bell? Well, what are these things on I the think it's here. It's a very old bell. Mm -hmm. And I chalked out the lettering, as you can see, with the bell founder's name, Johannes. Yes. Now, he lived in King's Lynn about 1330 or so. 1330? And that bell was made years 600 ago. years ago. That, that's been hanging in some church for six centuries. Yeah, that's right, yes. Magnificent. Now, these yes. loops on the top, yeah. what we call cannons, now, they're part of... ...cannons. Now, they're part of the bell. They're not stuck on afterwards, like a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. They're part of the bell. It's very complicated foundry work to do that. And the idea of them was to support the bell. Yes. In those yes. days, they couldn't drill holes, and they never thought of nuts and bolts. So, on top of these loops was the bit of timber, and the local blacksmith put wrought iron straps through those loops, fastened to the timber. That's how they supported very it. Very ingenious, isn't this? Go and have a look at how they do, hang on. Right. Magnificent hinges on your door. Do you, do you have many like that about? Ah, uh, not very many. But years ago, there was a lot of blacksmith's work in mm -hmm. bell hanging, not bell founding, bell hanging. Yes. And my grandfather was very fond of smithies. And so he let his imagination run riot and told his blacksmith to make the nice, handsome hinges that you see there. They're a real joy, aren't they? And they a are. lovely lot, too. Look, look oh, at yes. this. Oh, yes. There we are. And they still work. Yes, they do, indeed. Now, here's another of these old bells with the... Uh, Funny top on with ah, the this was made by the mayor of Nottingham about in 1500 or so, mm -hmm. 450 odd years ago. It's come in here to have the 450 years of Nottingham dirt taken off it, and then it's going back to the church to ring again. To ring again, oh, lovely, good. I love the shapes you get here. You get such beautiful shapes. Ah, they mean a lot to me, being a bell founder. Mm -hmm. I can tell by the various shapes. You can see the top there and the top there, the distant. Uh, how the bell founder of that day thought a bell should be. Mm, lovely, aren't they? Yes. 
What are these? Now, these bells here, they're going to Coggishall in Essex. The, bell, the church was absolutely destroyed in the war and is now being rebuilt. But the only things left of the old church were the bells, and they're going back into the church to sound again. Oh, long may they ring. What's this contraption here? Ah, uh, this is a bell frame being erected, and as you can see, the whole lot is finished here, so that when the bell hanger gets into the tower, we know very well that all the nuts and bolts and all the holes and things will fit. So it's no use him complaining, because he said, oh no, we've erected it here. And there, he puts it at the top of the tower, and the bells, of course, will Sit go into the... the Oh, here's your joiner's shop, is it? That's right, yes. Now you'll see some really nice woodwork. Oh, absolutely <coughs> lovely, isn't it? Magnificent. Just a moment, I wish I could Walter. do carpentry yeah. like this. This is a bell wheel. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's all made of oak. Yes. Made just like a piece of furniture should be. Absolutely disfigured, isn't it? Yeah. The old pegs. The idea is it's very good quality oak because it gets up to the top of the tower and the four winds of heaven blow on it. And if you weren't careful, it would go like a dog's hind leg mm -hmm. and the rope would come off the wheel. Well, now, if the rope does come off the wheel, it might cause a bit of damage to the rim here. Yeah. You can see this is nailed. Yes, and it's and also in segments, isn't it, it's about this segment, long? But it's not oak. This is elm, mm -hmm. a very tough wood. And the idea is that when a bit does break off, the local villager come undertaker can pinch a bit off a coffin <laughs> and stick a bit on. <laughs> yes, well, so, so much for that. But uh, these spokes here, uh, they're very intricate pattern, aren't they? Oh, well, yes. Why are they that shape? Well, I've got over here a model bell. Mm -hmm. And you'll see then. Oh, I see. Now, yes, we've got the same wheel you again. You recognise mm -hmm. the shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here is what we call the headstock. It's of course, everything, the wheel and the bell. And spokes come out of the side of the headstock. Uh, and the ropes <coughs> fit on That's the ones right, above yes. the headstock. And the wheel is made in two parts across yeah. here. So that's why we have two sort of spokes there, and of course one in between to stiff up. To take the strain across here. here. Mm -hmm. Now underneath the, the bell, the bell sticks out a bit. Oh, out this way, that's so right. it does. Why so is that? So you can have spokes like I that. I see, yes, and yes. Side. But w what intriguing me is this absolutely magnificent oh, patterning, nice, isn't, isn't it? it? Oh, exquisite. My grandfather indeed. actually made this bell, yeah. and the method used is what is now called the lost wax process. Mm, it's beautiful, Very popular at the moment. Good, it is. Right, well, I can quite see how that works, so, so much for making them. Um, what I'd like to do now is have a look how we use them. I think we've got some handbells here. That's right, yeah. These are about the now you simplest pick one up possible form, aren't they? And try and work it. This is the smallest and the simplest, the traditional mm -hmm. English handbell. He goes if you wind him, hit him that way, but if you That's hit him right. that way, he doesn't, because the, the, uh, the clapper That's will only it. work in one plane. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that, because it only goes one way, when you get clever, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, do it two bells in each hand Gracious. by wiggling your hand that way yeah. or that way yeah. and I put it in there like that and here can you play it a tune? And there like that well mm. we can play a tune I've got a friend of mine over here Colin will you come? it is Colin Harrison hello Colin and between hello. us we enliven the, the evening by playing tunes sure you do what are you going to play and we're dying now to try <laughs> our idea of the bluebells of Scotland right ho well now look before you try the bluebells of Scotland um, there is a magnificent carolin you also make carolin That's bells right, don't yes. you there's a magnificent carolin in Loughborough Park and we took a film of it the other day uh, we took a film of a tune of it uh, the other day which we would like to um, play back for you after uh, Mr. Taylor and Colin here have played the Bluebells of Scotland on the handbell, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Right, I'll start off, Colin, with them. Get out of your way, shall I? This is the carolin that stands in Queen's Park, Loughborough. It's over 150 foot high and every bit of it's made in our own town, even the bricks. 
There are 47 bells in this carillon, the biggest being over four tons. We built it in 1922 as a war memorial. There are unusual things in this country, so let's go inside and have a closer look. Where you see that round window is the place where the actual playing's done. This is Eric Jordan, the only borough carillon in the country. And with a job like that, I should think he'd be a good candidate for what's my line. He's adjusting the wires. And he's putting on now some special gloves. You'll see why in a minute. Each of these wires is connected to the clappers above the bells. It's not as complicated as it looks. There are the black notes. There are the white notes, if you like. And at his feet are the bass notes. These cadences show you what a good bell player can do. Hot work, isn't it? Now you can see why he took his coat off. If it hadn't been so jolly cold, shorts would have been worn. Eric Jordan learnt this unusual art at the Carolin School at Malines in Belgium, which is the home of Carolin playing. And here's his certificate of honour from the school in this typical Flemish town. And now he's going to play his arrangement of the famous piece, Country Gardens. told you, carolins are rather uh, continental forms of bells, and here we've got the climax of English bell ringing. Here we've got the whole of the craftsmanship that we've seen, the lovely wheel, the lovely beautifully made woodwork, and the bells, all mounted, ready to play, ready to ring. And we've got something that's rather unusual here too, I think, because normally it's impossible to see bells ringing and the ringers at the same time because the ringers are in the belfry and the bells are several stories up above. And so here we've got these bells mounted over a pit and presently we're going to get a team of bell ringers to go down and do some change ringing for you and you'll be able to see the bell ringers we hope in the pit and the bells up here all at once so that you can see the exact mechanism of the change and how it works. But we've got something else that's rather unusual too for you tonight because one of the personal facets of this craft of bell ringer that intrigues me so much is this, that every set of bells is made for a specific place and a specific set of people. And it's quite common for a team of bell ringers to come down and see the bells that they're going to handle for years to come cast. And tonight we've got something that is uh, very pleasant from my point of view and that is that this peal of five ringing bells, this ringing peal of five bells here, is going up to Scotland, and we have got Mr. Crichton Miller, who is the headmaster of Fetis. Good evening, sir. Mr. Crichton Miller here is the headmaster of Fetis, the very famous Scotch public school. He is going to have these bells at his school, and he's come down, we hope, to hear them rung for the first time and to see them. Now, 
Can you tell me sir, the story behind these bells? Yes, I can. Um, I must say it's an unusual and novel method of delivery. <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> I'm rather hoping you won't want a check at the end of this uh, performance. <laughs> uh, now, we have always had a chapel bell, but unfortunately uh, it became cracked. And when uh, an old Fetisian called J.R. Lamberton offered to do something for us, uh, we suggested, amongst other things, that he might like to replace this bell. And to cut a long story short, I came down here and you let me hear a peal of bells similar to these in your tower. Right, yeah. And I was so taken with this and so taken with the idea that this was a, a thing that boys might do with profit <laughs> An educational pursuit. Indeed, yes. <laughs> uh, that I suggested to Mr. Lamberton that he might provide a whole peal of bells instead of one bell. Mm -hmm. And these are the bells, and it's the first time I've seen them. They're in memory of Andrew Robertson Lamberton, his brother, which you can, as you can see from the inscription on that tenor it's bell. Mm -hmm. And we hope that the Men who are going to ring them are now, at this moment, receiving their first lesson in that art. At least uh, I left instructions that 18 boys were to watch <laughs> this program in order that they should see, for the first time, how these bells should be rung. And I'm sure they're all looking forward now to mm -hmm. hearing them being rung for us. Right, oh well, Paul, will you arrange for that? Will you get your team of ringers down? and uh, explain to us what's happening in, uh, in change ringing because it's something that's quite yeah. beyond Well, me, I'll do my best, but first I'll call the ringers. I've got five members of my staff. Colin, will you come along? <coughs> now you'll see these five chaps going downstairs, just like bell ringers do normally. Normally, of course, they go upstairs. And uh, in the pit, you'll see that each of them taking hold of a rope. And they're going to ring what we bell ringers call Stedman doubles. Now, the word doubles means four, two pairs. And in mathematically speaking, two pairs of bells are continually altering the position among the others. The word Stedman comes from Fabian Stedman, who was the father of change ringing. So we honor him by calling him, calling the name Stedman his name. Here they are going in what we call rounds, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Right, you are. Well, if that were a ship we'd made, we'd be cracking a bottle of champagne. But what is the more fitting for a peal of bells than that they should ring themselves into existence? So let's wish them good luck. And may they ring out that call for centuries and prove to those that come after us that even in 1956, craftsmanship in England was still very much alive.